evening and uh, welcome to this uh, inaugural Eli and Sylvia Kaduri lecture. Great privilege to be able, 25th year after the death of Eli Kaduri, and just one year after the death of Sylvia Kaduri, to commemorate this remarkable academic duo who influenced uh, so much of the academic understanding of the Middle East. Eli Kaduri, of course, was <coughs> the chair at London University, Sylvia Kaduri, during their marriage and uh, after Eli Kaduri's demise in her widowhood as uh, editor of uh, the wonderful journal Middle Eastern Studies. It's uh, a particular pleasure to be able to commemorate both of them in the presence of the Kaduri family, of Eli and Sylvia Kaduri's issue, of Michael Kaduri, George Kaduri, Helen Kaduri, thank you for uh, being willing to support us, for being unofficial patrons and patroness of this event, which we hope to uh, continue for reasons that are too obvious to enumerate. Please join me in expressing our appreciation to them. <laughs> Many of us will have uh, favorite works by both uh, Eli Kaduri and Sylvia Kaduri, but I think the one that is uh, most piquant and stands most in memory, and certainly at this present juncture in time, is uh, perhaps the most uh, relevant, although many no doubt here, not least in the family, will wonder at many moments what would Eli or Sylvia have thought of X, Y, or Z issue in the contemporary firmament. But I think the one certainly that uh, stands out most at the moment is the Chatham House version. And what was previously a subject of intense academic interests to specialists. And the reason why we're holding this is because that subject which was previously a uh, very, very sort of niche area has suddenly become perhaps front and center in terms of discussion amongst elements of Muslim youth and beyond in this country, in Europe, and in the wider world. In particular, of course, the alleged culpability of the West in imposing a Westphalian style state system to break up the unity of the Muslim Ummah in the wake of the Great War and the demise of the Ottoman Empire. And that's the reason why I thought back to the memory of Eli and Sylvie Kaduri, and uh, more particularly to somebody who might have had many happy discussions uh, about on this topic, Sir John Jenkins, not only an outstanding scholar, linguist, and, but also a practitioner of the diplomatic arts with an intimate knowledge of the region and what Eli and Sylvia Kaduri stood for. So it's a great honor to be able to welcome Sir John for the first time publicly onto our platform today, though we've been delighted to have several uh, blog postings by him which have uh, elicited just the amount of rage which we would have liked as a thing. <laughs> so Sir John, welcome to our platform for the first time. We look forward to hearing what you have to say and then they'll open, no doubt, to uh, some uh, Q&A that uh, Eli and Sylvia Kaduri would have enjoyed themselves in the course of their researches and pronouncements. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Is it? Okay, I'm just trying very hard not to get <laughs> entangled with the lights, but I'm not at all indeed. Why um, well, we banned Chris Gray from that spot? <laughs> you will. Some of you may remember what um, what Dr. Johnson said about 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 Milton's Paradise Lost, but nobody ever wished it longer. Um, uh, this uh, th this uh, uh, lecture this evening is already quite long in the in the spoken version. It's even longer in the written version. I think it's two or three times as long in the written version, which has all the evidence uh, for a lot of the uh, statements uh, I make. So if you want to see uh, why I think the way I do, you should read the uh, the printed uh, written lecture. Um, but first of all, thank you very much, Dean, and thank you to the family. Um, uh, and it's a great honor for me to speak here this evening um, at Policy Exchange. I first came across uh, the writings uh, of Ile Kadori uh, some 36 years ago when I first started studying Arabic at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, and the first of his essays I read wasn't actually the Chatham House version. It was uh, Afghani and Abdul, an essay on religious belief, unbelief and political activism in modern Islam. And I loved from the start 
uh, his waspish and scrupulous attention to the evidential basis of what a historian can and cannot properly say. The Chatham House version, after which the lecture is, of course, uh, named, is perhaps, as Dean said, the most definitive example of this, of this manner. Uh, it's also an ad hominem attack on someone, Arnold Toynbee, uh, whom Cadori seems to have regarded as embodying all the faults of a late imperial elite who viewed the world through lenses ground by an exclusivist Western modernity shaped in the distorting crucible of 19th century European nationalism, polished by a meliorist and patrimonial incrementalism, and framed by cultural pessimism. Now, Cadori um, believed, I think, uh, it was an offence against history to make claims that either could not be substantiated or distorted the available truth, however unavailable that truth might be in its entirety in the interests of an unacknowledged ideology or epistemic framing system. Uh, we are all, of course, to paraphrase uh, Keynes, usually the slaves of some, of some defunct ideologue. But unacknowledged ideologies and ideological biases lead us astray. My very distinguished uh, friend and, uh, and colleague, Professor Toby Dodge, who may be here this evening, um, uh, who is, of course, one of uh, Ilya Kadori's uh, successors at the London School of Economics, uh, continues in his work to illustrate in great and compelling detail how these uh, unacknowledged biases undermined not just the first British adventure in Iraq from 1917 to 1932, uh, but the later Anglo-American adventure after 2003, a theme that would have spoken, uh, I think, to uh, Professor Kadori with his own background, of course, in the prosperous but now vanished Jewish community of early 20th century Baghdad, and his dismay at the undermining of an existing, if emergent, Arab modernity by the exoticization of the post-Ottoman Middle East. Too often today, those charged with formulating and implementing policy, not just here in the United States, in, 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 in uh, continental Europe, seem still to labor under Delusions that are framed by a Procrustean cropping of the facts to serve an often unexpressed purpose. A determination, for example, to see the Saudi position on uh, all sorts of political Islamisms as monocausal and unreflective. And the lack of Saudi state capacity as a product of institutional primitivism. I wish to see the British government simply as a willing agent of the malign designs of others a refusal to accept that the small but rich and often socially permissive, if highly securitized, emirates of the lower Gulf might have good reason to fear the political revolutionary designs of political Islamism, both Sunni and Shia. A fixed belief that the Muslim Brotherhood has evolved over the years into a set of national and more moderate actors within quasi-democratic and representational systems, hand in hand with a conviction that politically organized Islamism is something more than a cunningly crafted, ideologically modernist and populist movement intent on constructing normative hegemony and eventually monopolizing power. Often, indeed, the authentic expression of a distinctive and fixed Muslim political sociology. A refusal to acknowledge that there had also been strong and equally authentic secular, leftist and nationalist movements in recent Arab history, which had not simply withered, but had been actively suppressed or suborned by more organized power centers within individual states. And that this might be the real reason for the absence of a Habermasian public sphere, not, as is often held, fear of an Islamist planet. And finally, a cavalier disregard for historical accuracy in the interests of a self-verifying narrative. And lurking behind much of this is a solipsistic historicism. The history of the modern Middle East is often understood chiefly as a product of Western misdeeds and misprisions. Not only does this deny agency to the people of the region, a curious form of occluded Orientalism, it also suggests that Western policy can only ever properly be penitential, clouding any clarity about interests or advantage. So let me set out, in what I hope is a Cadorian spirit, how we might understand some important contemporary aspects of the Middle East and North Africa, not the Chatham House, but perhaps the policy exchange version. And I want to focus on two specific themes which interact in complex but meaningful ways. Political Islamism 
and the wider ideological crisis in today's Middle East, before turning to how we in this country make our own policy choices. Given the current tensions in the GCC of the Gulf Corporation Council, the continued advance of Iran, the unease that this in turn creates in the Sunni rural states of the region, the highly contested issue of sectarianism and continued policy debate about how we should collectively react to the range of metastasizing Islamisms across the region, this seems to me highly topical. And I first want to address the issue, central to the choices we face, of political Islamism, and more particularly the relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and movements such as Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, other varieties of less activist and brutal Salafism, and indeed the actual practice of majority Muslim nation states. I recently read a number of intriguing pieces on this whole area. One uh, uh, on the relative moderation, for example, of elements within Hayat Tahrir uh, al in Syria. Another drawing a distinction between Saudi, quote, Wahhabis who object to concerts and mixed parties, unquote, and allegedly moderate Muslim brothers. And more particularly, a pair of articles, one by Colin Clark on the moderation of Al-Qaeda compared to the Islamic State, and another by the distinguished French scholar Olivier Roy, in which he suggested that there is a distinction to be drawn between essentialist and contextual views of the Brotherhood. This debate continues to shape policy discussions here and in the US as well. Now, understanding Islamists is essential. But the attempt to place them on some scale of relative extremism or moderation only tells us something about Islamist methodology, not ideology, and how we measure relationships within a closed system of our own devising. As a guide to policy or action, I think it almost worthless. First of all, it is, of course, perfectly possible to be contextual and essentialist at the same time, less inclined to the theatrics of exemplary violence, but equally inclined to ideological extremes. That does not mean that social movements jettison their original goals as they manoeuvre, a lesson I thought we had all learned long ago from Gramsci. They are all historically contingent, arise from particular causes and adapt to their environments. For me, the two most original and enduring responses to the crisis of governance, legitimacy and social justice that have afflicted the region since the emergence of the modern Middle Eastern state system in the 1920s, both involved the innovative mobilization of Islam as an ideology with which to shape not tradition, but modernity in very different ways. The first, the creation of a classically reimagined but territorially defined Islamic state buttressed by the consolidation of power in the name of an authentic nativism, happened uniquely in what became Saudi Arabia, about which I shall speak later. The second response was to dismiss the nation state entirely call for the placing of a highly textualized Islam at the center of political, social, and economic life, define the largely Christian and secular West as a moral other, and claim that the restoration of a specifically pan-Arab caliphate to replace a tarnished Ottoman version would restore the lost glory of the Muslim world. This was a project created by the Muslim Brotherhood, the first and foundational movement of mobilized Islamism, launched in his own rather mythopoeic account by Hassan al-Banna, in the Egyptian provincial city of Ismailia in March 1928. In contrast to the Saudi narrative of tribal unity in Islam under a legitimate ruler within a single state, it involved reimagining the boundaries of the political, not just the religious community. Logically, if Islam was criterion, then that community was not ethnic, linguistic, or national. As with the original Muslim community in 7th century Medina, it was defined exclusively by religious affiliation, the Ummah. Albana drew on the ideas of the so-called Islamic modernists of the late 19th and early 20th century, mixed with elements of what came rather misleadingly later to be known as Salafism, as well as Sufism, Egyptian nationalism, German romanticism, European, particularly Italian fascism, and badly understood but rarely acknowledged 20th century European prophets of decline, like Oswald Spengler. Albana was the first person to make these issues the key to mass political activism, in the service of not just as socially or religiously, but also politically revolutionary and ideologically totalizing movement. He was often ambiguous about what he wanted and what he meant. The Muslim Brotherhood had sometimes violent political rivals in the 1930s and 1940s, Egypt, the Waft, the Saudists, and so forth. It was co-opted by and also encountered hostility from national political elites. But it created a foundational <coughs> template for all future dissident and insurgent Islamic, Islamist movements, from those which saw a route 
to absolute power through electoral politics to those which chose instead vanguardist finance. <coughs> Albana may initially have conceived of Jihad as primarily one of social transformation through preaching and persuasion, but he soon came to promote what he called Fan el mawt <coughs> the art of death. <coughs> Urged his followers to scorn life, claimed that ultimate martyrdom could only be attained through death in the service of the divine, articulated a vague but, 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 but clear doctrine of armed physical force at the Brotherhood's Fifth Conference in 1939, contemplated a frontal assault on power, and allowed the creation of a paramilitary force and violent attacks, including assassinations against the Egyptian government, Egyptian Jews, and the British. And on top of this, the writings of <laughs> Said Qutb, executed by Nasser in 66, who gravitated towards the Brotherhood in the late 1940s and remains its most significant <coughs> and protean ideologue, remain central to Brotherhood thinking everywhere and continue to be used to justify multiple forms of Islamist violence. More generally, political Islamism is construed by Albana and most systematically Qutb, rejects most existing political systems as un-Islamic. It seeks to replace the secular and post-West failing with a new Islamized order nationally and internationally. The Brotherhood is prepared to use physical force where events do not move in its favor, or they are not allowed to operate with sufficient freedom. It gives little space to the tolerance, choice, and individual freedoms we claim to value. It has no commitment to democratic choice as the fundamental expression of a political community. It rejects what we consider to be the self-evident legal equality of individuals, regardless of gender or religion. It is constitutively anti-Semitic and homophobic. It seeks power. Its approach to education and societal cohesion is unlikely to promote inclusivity. It seeks power first, and as we saw in Egypt in 2012 and 2013, its understanding of how to run modern states is fatally flawed and was rejected by a majority of Egyptians. Its eschatological and self-justifying narratives of conspiracy and righteous endurance represent not a form of cognitive primitivism, but a sophisticated gnosis that promises to unmask occult forces and secure eventual triumph. History shows that this message speaks powerfully to the emotional needs of those adrift in a dysfunctional world where sinners' ways prosper, disappointment ends all righteous endeavors, the signs of salvation seem endlessly deferred, and the hidden hands of the enemies of Islam, not a benign Weltgeist, turn the wheels of time. It has been a school for many of the most violent Islamist radicals of our time, from Osama bin Laden to Abdullah Azim to Abu Musab al-Suri, Abu Bakr al -Baghdadi. And that suggests we should resist the temptation to seek to understand the Muslim Brotherhood through our own cultural or epistemological categories. The common tendency to think of them as a version of the Christian Democrats, where the men have beards, the women are veiled, and they pray five times a day, is misguided. It is undoubtedly true that the Brotherhood <laughs> contains a range of views, and there have been Muslim Brotherhood reformers who want more openness and plurality. But true reformists within the Brotherhood, like extremists, tend to leave. It's also true that an orthodox Islamic Jewry had on its conflicts and its cohesion as a political space, leaving the Gulf with all its tensions as almost the last surviving functional sub-state system in the Arab Middle East. And here it is important to consider Iran and Shia political Islam, Islamism. For Islamism is not simply Sunni. Radical Shia Islamists have undergone a similar process of globalization and deculturation to their Sunni counterparts. And there was a fascinating process of simultaneous attraction and repulsion between the Sunni and Shia Islamist poles. The first mobilized Shia Islamist movement in the region, uh, a Dawah in Iraq, arose after 1958 out of the clerical opposition to Abdul Karim Qasim's revolutionary dispensation, and particularly to his leftist leaning, drawing on the same intellectual milieu and many of the same texts that produced the Iraqi branch of the Brotherhood. Links between the Brotherhood and the Khomeini's trend in Iran go back as far as the 1950s. Now, the claims of Iran itself are based in a specific form of ethno-nationalist and cultural exceptionalism, as well as in religious identity. And the ideological ferment of the last 60 years has produced different currents, as with Sunni Islamism. Some stands are clerical, some are anti-clerical, but all are revolutionary. Together, these strands represent as powerful a challenge to national loyalties as that represented by the Muslim Brotherhood and its analogues and they've been backed by an aggressive militia-led Iranian activism across the region for the last 38 years. 
This strategy is in practice the model that Khomeini and Zayas first adopted within Iran. They were a vanguardist movement, espousing a heterodox imamism. Uh, the Iranian revolution, like Egypt's in 2011, was produced by students, leftists, bizarres, people whose children have been educated into a economy with not enough jobs. But it was hijacked by part of the clerical class, which has always had an awkward relationship with constitutionalism and representational norms. To sustain this new system, it created its own shock troops, the Besiege and the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guards. If you look at opinion polling and social surveys in Iran recently, you'll see significant and often majority support for normalizing relationships with the United States and for greater social and political freedoms. In 1997, perhaps 70% of the IRGC may have voted for the reformist Ayatollah uh, Khatami. The response of the conservatives was to increase the indoctrination of IRGC recruits and existing cadres and create a new ability in this and other pillars of the clerical state to reproduce themselves as an elite instrument, a, nom a, a, a nomenclatura of authoritarian Islamism in spite of currents in the wider society. Iran is a highly complex and sophisticated society, but the state is sustained by ideologically motivated security forces and armed levies against its own people. And in parallel with this, we have seen what I call the sacralized sacrification of the Levant. The 1989 uh, Ta'if Agreement, which ended the Lebanese Civil War, sought to take militias out of politics, <laughs> but it only succeeded in ceding power to one of them, the most powerful, Hezbollah, which operates as a state within a state. We have progressively seen the same thing happen in Iraq, where the three most powerful men today are probably Hadi al Amri of the Badr organization, the effective commander of the popular mobilization units of Hashti Shadi, Abu Mahdi al Mahandis of Qatar of Hezbollah, and the effective deputy of the Hash, and Qais al Khazari, the leader of Asa ibn Ahl al Haq, the Leagues of the Righteous. All ideologically Islamist, all revolutionary, all backed by Iran and fighting on its behalf, not just in Iraq, most recently over Kirkuk and Tel Afar, but also in Syria. And that should tell us something important, as should the expressed desire of Iran with its subalterns to control a swathe of territory from the Iraq Iran border to the Mediterranean and down to the Golan Heights. None of this is a secret. Iranian and Iraqi Shia commanders tell us openly this is what they want. They make a display of meeting and greeting each other on the Iraqi Syrian border and in southern Syria. More recently, Hezbollah, in its campaign to expel the Islamic State, Daesh, from Arsal on the Lebanese Syrian border and its expansion down to southern Syria, has undermined the Lebanese armed forces struck prisoner deals with the Islamic State as if they represented the Lebanese state, infringed Iraqi sovereignty and national security by seeking to transport freed Daesh fighters back to Iraq, and proclaimed its intent to continue to act as both the principal guardians and recoverers of Lebanese territory, and as one of the key guarantors of the Assad regime in Syria on behalf of Iran. And it is this ideological competition that underpins the sectarianization of political conflict in the wider Gulf and in Syria. Saudi Salafism is certainly part of the dialectic from which sectarianism and other extremism spring. But the Saudi government sees domestic sectarian division as a major national security concern. And internationally, it often tends to back secular politics, including the Shia, Ayad al-Awi in Iraq, and the secular, very liberal, Hariris in Lebanon, whatever's happening now. Nor is sectarianism the inevitable result of age-old enmities. There is undoubtedly deep anti-Shia prejudice among many Sunni communities. And Shia have been disadvantaged and oppressed in many Sunni majority states. But the most important inflection point for the region was a dramatic mobilization of the 1979 Iranian Revolution, which for the first time, perhaps since the Fatimids, made Arab Shia identity politically consequential and coincided with the assault by Juhaman al Atebi and his group on the Grand Mosque in Mecca and the subsequent conflict with Saddam's Iraq which gave rise to a thousand forms of adversarial, transnational, and often violent Shia activism. And this brings me to the current dispute between Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, and Egypt on one side, and Qatar, and perhaps Turkey <coughs> on the other. Most analysts seem to believe that the fundamental reason of this dispute, as with more recent events in Saudi Arabia, is a clash of egos. This seems to me both patronizing and misconceived. The crisis arises out of the logic of five decades of Gulf socioeconomic development, 
the evolution of different politically legitimating discourses and the urgent challenge of all varieties of political Islamism. It reflects important emerging differences in the political sociology of the Gulf. And it poses fundamental questions, not just about the GCC, but about the future of the wider region. And this matters to all of us, but not necessarily in the way we think. As many have pointed out, it's perhaps surprising that the Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood in itself, should have become such a contentious issue. Links between the Gulf and the Brotherhood go back to its foundation. Abdul Aziz famously forbade the Muslim Brotherhood to organize formally in Saudi Arabia. But he also reportedly invited Hassan al-Banna twice to settle in the Hejaz, once in 1928 and a second time after the Egyptian government had sought to dissolve the Brotherhood in, in, in 1948, just before al-Banna's assassination. The annual Hajj, where al-Banna and his successor, Hassan al-Hadebi, were allowed to operate freely, was a key to much of the Muslim Brotherhood's early proselytization and its later reconstitution in the early 1970s. By the early 1950s, the Brotherhood had managed to organize in Kuwait and Bahrain, which were politically the most advanced of the emerging states, and the Saudi state gave huge material and moral support from the late 1920s to the 1980s to the Muslim Brotherhood and related groups. But the driving impulse of this was raison d'etat, not ideological convergence. The Saudis wished to harness the Brotherhood as an instrument of statecraft in the battle against other more immediate and obviously revolutionary states. And this came back to haunt them. The Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990, welcomed by the Brotherhood internationally, exposed deep fault lines in the Arab world. It suggested that the pan-Islamist aims of the Brotherhood and other more extreme groups, which sprang from it, and increasingly worldly and national ambitions of prosperous Gulf states, might be irreconcilable. In addition, in some places, the presence of committed proselytizing and increasingly salafized Muslim brothers and the support provided to the Brotherhood and its offshoots by Saudi religious institutions produced an ideological ferment combining Muslim Brotherhood political activism and Qutbist takfirism with an intense Salafi focus on issues of doctrine and personal conduct. From the 1960s onwards, this produced a regional movement, which was most powerful in the 1990s, known as the Islamic Sahwa, the Awakening, which came in the 1990s to pose its various forms of powerful ideological challenge to existing political dispensations. And the eyes of some helped set the scene of the Al-Qaeda-related terror campaigns of the early 2000s uh, in Saudi Arabia. In reality, the connections were complex and often indirect. Fueled as much by ideological fissures as by agreement. But this is characteristic of all Islamist movements. And the perception of threat was heightened by the involvement of Sahwa, awakening scholars, in the petitions movement, fueled by the US presence in the kingdom after 1990, where you, you will recall groups of scholars submitted petitions to the king asking for political reforms. Uh, which essentially would have given them more power. The unease this all caused perhaps became apparent first when the then Chief Mufti of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, issued fatwas in the late 1990s stigmatizing the Brotherhood as deviationists. And more definitively, in 2002, through a famous interview uh, in a Kuwaiti newspaper, a CSA, with the late Prince Nayef, who was then the Minister of the Interior. And Naif spoke bitterly about the Saudi and Kuwaiti experience in 1990 and 91, accused the Brotherhood of betraying the trust of the Gulf states. And this complex experience forms the background to the current situation. In Saudi Arabia and the UAE combined in 2012 to 2013 with the events of the Arab Spring to bring into sharp focus a fundamental difference of approach that has profound implications for its future. And this rests upon differing interpretations, not only of the precise trajectory of events in Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Tunisia, and Syria, but of their political significance and likely consequences. Broadly speaking, there are three distinct schools of thought in the region. First, those who saw, and perhaps still see, political Islamism, notably but not exclusively in its Muslim Brotherhood manifestation, as the wave of the future. Second, those who saw and see it as a permanent and significant feature of the landscape that needs to be integrated but constrained within existing or emergence, emerging security political systems, and third, those who saw and will always see it as the most serious challenge for the stability of the region, its prosperity and security, and the survival of its ruling elite since the high tide of Nasserism in the 1960s. Those in the third group, which include the rulers of Saudi Arabia, Egypt, UAE, Jordan, and Bahrain, believe the raw will to power underlies all regional politics, given added life by revolution. The only rulers who can tame this rough beast generate sustained legitimacy and deliver stability and prosperity of those who arise naturally from the cultural contours of a particular time, place, and culture. 
like themselves. For them, the behaviour of the Brotherhood from the beginning of the revolution in Egypt, and most egregiously once they secured power, confirmed beyond a shadow of a doubt that the ultimate goal of the Egyptian Brothers, and indeed the Brotherhood as a whole, was to gain control of the Arab world's most populous and culturally resonant state, Egypt, to remake it as a Brotherhood stronghold, arrange matters in such a way that they remained in power indefinitely, and use that platform to promote Brotherhood ideology across a region prepared for it by 80 years of sustained effort. They believe the activities of the Muslim Brotherhood and its associates in Libya, Tunis, and Yemen were part of this plan. They believe the Muslim Brotherhood would not have stopped at the Red Sea. Nasser saw the same countries as key to his own very different hegemonic ambitions. This was the Islamist reboot. The Saudis, and many others on the receiving end of is Islamist interventions, now believe that the shape-shifting nature of radical Islamist thought in general is a direct threat to national cohesion and identity at a time when such things are more important to them than ever. Both the Emirates and Saudi Arabia see the Muslim Brotherhood as a secretive, partisan, double-talking and divisive organisation dedicated to a self-defined purification of Islam and the establishment of a transnational Islamic state through incremental but ultimately revolutionary political activism using tactical violence if necessary. It mimics some central features of a state through its hierarchical structure and the requirement for members to swear allegiance to the murshid, to the supreme uh, guide, but it repudiates national identity and any loyalty other than that to the murshid and God. And they have concluded that this represents a dangerously and deliberately radical misreading of Islamic history in the service of anarchy, which is their term. For the Saudi elite, the kingdom is already a perfectly satisfactory Islamic state whose ruler is religiously legitimate, manifested in his ability to enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong, and by the unity of belief and of country. All Saudis owe absolute loyalty to him as Wali al-Amr in the Salafi Hanbali tradition as they interpret it. Anyone who acknowledges fealty to another is therefore disloyal by definition. This is analogous to their problem with those Shia who acknowledge the temporal and spiritual sovereignty of an external Shia religious authority implied in the heterodox doctrine of Walayat al faqih the guardianship of the jurisprudence. Or indeed, the Shirazi doctrine, another uh, school of uh, the, the radical Islamism within, within, uh, within Shia Islam, emanating from uh, Karbala rather than Mecha, of Shura al fuqahir which is the consultancy of the jurisprudence. It's similar, I should say, to, to, to I speak as a Catholic here, it's similar to John Rock's uh, view of the status of Catholics in his ideal Republic in his letter on toleration. Um, they had been engaged now for at least a decade, uh, the Saudis, in the delicate task of constructing a national identity precisely based on loyalty to the ruling dynasty and its reading of Islam, as well as a set of territorial and historical characteristics, an instantiation and inracination of Islam in rather than against the world. The new crown prince is clearly bent on modernizing not just the business structures of the kingdom, but also its social and educational acquis in the service of a new and more open economic model. This is high risk. Talk of robot cities and the recent wave of arrests are simply cover for a massively ambitious attempt to remake the kingdom without losing its foundational legitimacy. Political Islamism of all sorts, not least because it will give political meaning to resistance from the more traditional religious scholars, is a threat to this project. <coughs> And the Saudis know it has support within the kingdom itself. At the time of the clearing of the squares in Egypt in mid-2013, there was an upsurge of sympathy for the Egyptian Brotherhood on Saudi social media. This has ebbed, but it suggests vulnerability if other things were to go wrong. In a similar way, the Emiratis, in particular the leadership of Abu Dhabi, who acknowledge a far more diverse religious tradition than the Saudis, see the Brotherhood not just as subversive, but as reactionary and socially <coughs> illiberal and therefore opposed to everything they stand for in terms of a neo-patrimonial, Arab and Islamic, highly securitized and segmented, but also socially permissive modernity. They reject the argument that political Islamism is an irresistibly riding, rising tide. They say that they see it as a real threat to the prosperity and cohesion of the UAE, based as the Federation is, on an acceptance that cultures can meet, acknowledge each other, celebrate difference, prosper and still remain intact in a small, rich country with strongly conservative social traditions and major global ambitions in the southern Gulf at the hub of continents. For them, the choice is a controlled aggiornamento, 
a modern mirror of the centuries when the multicultural trading cities of the Gulf flourished in the interstices of the Ottoman, Persian, and British empires, or a religious closure. You might say, so what? This is small potatoes. But Emirati leaders are acutely aware of their vulnerability. Unsurprising when you have the sort of highly successful but demographically lopsided and materially vulnerable socio-economic structure that the UAE has. That's why the Emiratis are angered by the license given over the last decade to Brotherhood scholars like Yusuf al Qazawi on Al Jazeera and elsewhere, publicly to question their Islamic credentials and therefore their political legitimacy. With at most some 1.5 million nationals and a total population of around 10 million, and probably only one million, they feel the challenge in a way larger states might not, of maintaining harmony among large and diverse expansive <laughs> populations and solidarity among still highly conservative nationals. They think the Muslim Brotherhood have instrumentalized the Gulf once before, from the 1950s onwards, and would do so again. And they are wary of a residual underlying fragility of relations among the constituent parts of the Federation and with some powerful neighbors. Some may dispute this, but if you speak to senior Emiratis, there is no escaping the depth of feeling. And the fact is, they have a point. Above all, within the Arab world, their focus, like that of the Saudis, is on Egypt and the impact of events there on their domestic security. And the magnitude of this, in their eyes, cannot be exaggerated. In their view, if Egypt had fallen to the Brotherhood, the whole of North Africa would have eventually become a bastion of political Islamism. This would have been a disaster, occurring simultaneously with first the apparently unchecked spread of Iranian power through Iraq and Syria into Lebanon and now Yemen, Second, and relatedly, the emergence of a new battle-hardened, effective and coordinated transnational Shia gendarmerie in these areas, made up of the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guards, Hezbollah, Iraqi, Afghan and Pakistani Shia militias, Syrian Alawites and Houthis, and third, the rise of the Islamic State. Taken together, this would have mounted to the worst external security challenge the Gulf of the whole ever faced, at a time when the US and the UK were in their eyes showing declining interest in the region and a willingness to accommodate the Brotherhood and other Islamists in an apparent belief that this represented a vote for pluralism. That is why both countries attach so much importance now to binding Egypt rather than their Gulf neighbours into any serious new security dispensation in the region. The key point is this. As long as Islamists, including the Brotherhood, serve the interests of their host state and its allies, everything is fine. When they become a perceived instrument of fitna, sedition, uh, under the direction of external actors or independently, it is not. And this is a real quarrel the Saudis and the Emirates have with Qatar. They believe that Qatar and Turkey have consistently and in a sustained manner instrumentalized the Muslim Brotherhood internationally to serve their unilateral visions of a region where political Islamism becomes an instrument of their own national security interests as defined by AKP ideologues in Ankara and a small circle of decision makers in Doha. Now, some will say these fears are exaggerated and we should feel free to construe the issues differently and act accordingly. This crisis has simply empowered Iran and is hampering US and European policy in the region. This latter claim seems to me nonsense on stilts. What has empowered Iran has been 14 years of permissive US and European policies in Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria, where we have collectively made an impressive military effort from time to time, but without any clear policy goal. We let the Iranians colonize the Iraqi state, we have let Hezbollah, one of the major potential beneficiaries of the Gatari ransom deal in Iraq earlier this year, transform itself from a regional defense force with a criminal wing into a formidable and mobile transnational Praetorian force with a criminal wing, whose leaders regularly ignore the Lebanese government and threaten Saudi Arabia with partition. We let Nouri al Maliki, not an Iranian puppet, but someone whose interests coincided with theirs and who is now a cheerleader for them inside Iraq, steal the 2010 elections. And we are no nearer finding a sustainable policy response to a decade of Iranian advances through the institutions, territories, and command structures of the Levant, plus a campaign of destabilization on the cheap in Bahrain and Yemen. And yet we now say the big problem is a split in the Gulf Corporation Council, a GCC that was never united, whose members have never fully trusted each other, who all have border disputes with their neighbours, <coughs> who don't want to subordinate their defence postures to each other, and who have run divergent foreign policies for years. Who are we kidding? Before we press ahead with fixing this storm in a teacup while ignoring the ideological elephant in the room, 
We should at least make an effort to understand how the key regional actors see the situation, what the drivers of their actions are, and where our real interests lie. We should also remember that whatever we think of the UE, a plurality of young Arabs in international surveys consistently say that this is a place they would most like to live and work and which their own country should take as a model. An impressive one in three in the latest Asda Versa Marstella Survey of Arab youth, a country which is based in the Emirates, but actually reflects results you also see in the Arab barometer and elsewhere. This makes the UE twice as popular among young Arabs than the US. It is a success in a region with few successes. We should bear in mind that the reform program Prince Mohammed bin Salman has promoted in, the, in, in Saudi Arabia is precisely the sort of socio-economic reform we have consistently urged upon the kingdom, and success matters to us now more than ever. Failure is not an option. Most Saudis take the same view, even if their conceptions of success are not all the same. We might also bear in mind that a plurality of Gatoris have no time to the Muslim Brotherhood either and see Iran as a major threat, as to most Saudis and Emiratis. And when we reflect on all this, we might conclude that far from this crisis being personality-driven, it was the elite engagement of Islamists in the first place, constructed as it was on sets of interlocking personal relationships that are personalised and unreflective. It is a reaction that is structural and rational. It is at least in part a reaction to the instrumentalization by the Muslim Brotherhood of those who had thought they were doing the instrumentalization. the instrumentalization. This doesn't mean that this is a simple clash between democracy on the one hand and authoritarianism on the other. Qatar, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are each willing to support Democrats, oligarchs, liberals and reactionaries depending on the circumstances. As that icon of democracy, Periclean Athens, or that model of rational modernity, France during the 16th and 17th century both were. It is rather a question of the nature of the state, national security, who gets to determine social and political normativity and who uses whom in an age where the real threats are not to political systems, but to the existence of states themselves. And if I may be allowed a final Cadorian moment, this illustrates perhaps the hollowness of any version of history that sees all the problems of the region as a result of a predatory and conscienceless, conscienceless West. The states and peoples of the region have always been agents in their own right, however much they have sought to disguise the fact. The Sharif Hussein and his sons were as responsible as the Arab Bureau in Cairo for the failings of the Hussein McMahon correspondence. The emergence of the modern Middle East in the 1920s was a result of a complex interplay of forces. Now that we see agency more clearly asserted, as we strikingly saw in polling and popular protest in Egypt between 2011 and 2013, and most recently in dramatic developments in Saudi Arabia, many people sneer as if they are more comfortable with a curiously old-fashioned version of the region in which the locals are victims and outsiders generally the shapers and always the villains. And a final thought. We often say that British values form the basis of our policy in opposition to those of some, but perhaps not all forms of Islamism. But we seem unable to define what these values are. And one reason for me is that they are themselves ideological, reflecting a particular history and intellectual tradition, something with which we have become deeply uncomfortable. But how we respond to the challenge of 21st century post-modernity and its deformations is as fundamental for us as it is for nationalists, leftists, Trumpians, or Islamists. This demands an ideological self-awareness and confidence that seems in short supply. Postmodernists, like Islamists, textualize reality, and the absence of a god aestheticize politics. This epistemological aporia is disabling when we are faced with Islamist opponents who, like Dr. Johnson refuting Hume by kicking a stone, simply proclaim the foundational necessity of revelation and find in our radical doubt an intellectual decadence to match the moral collapse that our banner, Qutb, Khomeini, and Osama bin Laden all diagnose as the root of Western weakness. Their diagnosis is offensive, ignorant, and self-serving, but it serves the Manichaean purposes of Islamists to present the struggle as one between the morally pure and divinely guided, and the malign and cons conspiratorial lowlifes of the West, whose worldly power and wealth are satanic illusions sent to test faith. We need openly to rebut this nonsense, not simply as Kadori thought the Toynbees of this world did internalize the charge or regard it as an allowable and epiphenomenal prejudice. When he wrote his combative doctoral thesis at Oxford in the early 1950s, Ili Kadori believed the Western policy elites had lamentably failed to achieve an accurate understanding of political dynamics in the Middle East and indulged instead 
in fantasies of transplanted nationalism and a corrosive and narcissistic guilt. Our own fantasies of a transformed and benign Shia Islamist rule in Iran and Sunni Islamist acceptance of pluralist politics, the Rawlsian veil of ignorance, the Habermasian version of unprejudiced political debate in a liberal agora, and of a region where the biggest challenges are not absolutist ideologies, but a liberal state security structure. Yet successful electoral democracy requires the development of sustained habits of mind and social practices, a culture of civility, and a shared sense of the past and the future. It needs an acceptance that power can be transferred peacefully, a living memory of efficient and non-predatory state behavior, and an unintimidated civil society. It needs a common sense of justice and acceptance of the rule of law, and it needs strong, independent, and impartial state institutions to arbitrate. Hardly any of that is currently present in the Middle East. This absence is not foreordained, but elections there continue for complex reasons to produce tribal, reactionary, sectarian, and unstable governments. As a result, it is lifestyle liberals and the rulers of prosperous Gulf states who tend not to want elections. The latter have been more successful in material terms over the last 30 years, and at least one has become a more attractive model for young Arabs than any other state or set of states in the region. They also work as state actors within state systems and mostly accept the same premises as we do about the conduct of external relations. Islamists, in contrast, have been a disaster, mistaking ideational coercion and social provision for ideological consent. If we think the future belongs to the young, but the revolutions made by them tend to be hijacked by the more disciplined, then paradoxically this could mean that the Gulf states, with their growing cohorts of better educated, articulate, and demanding young people, their fear of revolution the recognition of the need for economic and social reform, at least, their securitized authoritarianism and their awareness of historically pluralist traditions within Islam may also eventually be the ones where political change without violent rupture and a restabilization of the region becomes thinkable. We need this to happen, and that, for me, is an ideologically more rational choice than believing that political Islamism, in any of its forms, has abandoned its revolutionary quest for sacralized hegemony and has become a more acceptable partner for us than those who want salvation in this world rather than the next. Thank you. I hope I'm not preempting anyone by saying that that was, of course, a master class, and uh, as the fit someone who's delivered a master class, Sir John very kindly agreed to answer <laughs> questions. Uh, as all of you know, the only house rule here is no question too outrageous. You just have to state your name for the organization first. Do I see any? Please. Do you like me? Name an organization. Do you want a microphone? Sorry, I'm shout. Okay. My name is Bari Alamuddin. I'm a journalist for the Times newspaper. John, you were in Iraq when the PLU and P or PNF, whatever you call them, were, were they were created before, of course, but you were there when they started to be rather active. When you were writing to the Foreign Office, <coughs> what was the answer? Thank you. Can we take one question at a time? One, one at a time. You know, you can't, you can't divorce policy towards Iraq after 2002 from the domestic political situation uh, here in the UK. And I think the fact is that actually, from the, almost the beginning, uh, Iraq became a very difficult, in some cases, a, a, a politically toxic subject within the United Kingdom for various reasons. There was a lot of dissent, it was highly contested. And I think a lot of governments, a lot of ministers, really, uh, after, certainly after 2005, stopped wanting to think about it. So there was an issue with, with, with engagement, actually, which is interesting because if you look at the US coming, and I think the same thing happened in the United States, um, and I think that if you look at what's happening, as example, Syria, uh, or indeed Iraq, still, with the United States, and the United States has had a very good military policy in some ways in, in, in Iraq, and to a certain extent in, in northeastern uh, uh, Syria, but there's no political strategy, there's no political project. And I think part of that is, is, is also the wider point 
about people losing faith in state buildings, the construction or the reconstruction of states. And I think this is something that, that Toby Dodge has written extensively about in the context of Ruach from the 1920s onwards. And if you, if you look at the experience of Ruach in the 1920s, it wasn't, in the end, a fantastic, a fantastic example. Although I should say, I think that the state that was created in the Ruach in the 1920s survived in some form until 1958. The state that was constructed in a way through the CPA in, from 2003 to 2004 lasted about 18 months. So you know, there's been this concertina, concertina of, uh, of effect. But I think a lot of it says, it says a lot about domestic politics here in the United States. Gentleman there in the, mid, in the middle aisle, name and organization, please. You. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Hugh Miles. I'm the editor of the Arab Digest website. Um, and um, it, it seems to me that the policy you're advocating of propping up these absolute uh, dictatorships in the region has demonstrably failed. Um, it is turning the Middle East and North Africa into a jihadi nightmare, and it has led to a uh, rise of terrorism on the streets of uh, Europe that we haven't seen since the 1970s. Is it not high time that we let the Arabs decide their own leaders and be free to choose who they want? And when we look at the elections that have taken place, in Egypt, for example, there were five plebiscites, 15 rounds of elections, and they always voted for Islamists. And this has been the same in Palestine, in Algeria, in other countries. So um, isn't this uh, policy that we've been uh, carrying on for the last 100 years, um, it's time to revisit this? Uh, I mean, that's, that's rather like asking me when I stop feeding my wife. Um, uh, if you look at, um, uh, uh, interesting, if you look at elections, so let's look at elections in the Middle East after 2011. So the Egyptian elections of uh, December 2011, January 2012, produced uh, about 11 million votes for the FJP on a voter roll of 52 million. Uh, if you look at the, at the elections to the upper house, I think from the April or May of, that, of 2012, uh, the FJP got 3 million votes. Um, uh, and this was an election which only Islamists voted for the upper house. When you look at the presidential elections, uh, to have someone like Ahmed Shafiq almost defeating uh, Morsi, uh, in, these, in, in, in the circumstances of Egypt, <laughs> he was extraordinary. He was, he was full of This man was, was a remnant of the hated previous regime. And it is basically 50-50. You look at Libya in 2012, the first parliamentary elections in Libya in 2012, under conditions of great insecurity and great intimidation, what you saw was people voting <coughs> for individuals in particular, but also for a slate under Jibril, Mahmoud Jibril, of people they thought would make a difference to their ordinary, to their, their everyday lives. They thought they were voting for people who would administer the state properly rather than impose an ideology. So I don't think elections show what you think they, they, they show at all in the Middle East. I think what they show is that people vote for people who will make a difference. If you look at polling throughout that period in Egypt from 2012 through to 2013, which was done by Pew and by Gallup and others, and in those days, then, you can't do it anymore, but then you could actually do quite sophisticated polling uh, with, uh, with very uh, uh, credible methodologies. What you saw was the popularity of the Muslim Brotherhood and the FGP falling off a cliff from about the middle of 2012. So actually, if you look at these polling results, what you see is, like, for me, the opposite of what you suggest. And in terms of us propping anybody up, I mean, I haven't seen us propping anybody up for at least 25 years, actually maybe even longer. The idea that we're propping up um, uh, the, uh, the, Saudi, the Saudi royal family or the, or the, or the Beni Fatima in Abu Dhabi it seems to me absurd. This isn't happening. We actually don't have a policy on a lot of these areas. The fact that we're propping these guys up, see, I mean, I'm sorry, I, just, I, 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 I disagree with a fundamental premise. With two fundamental premises. One, that we're propping them up, propping them up be that they're tyrannous. Name and organization. Thanks, John. I'm Ian Black from the London School of Economics. I would like to hear very much your assessment of the chances of Mohammed bin Salman, the Saudi Crown Prince, who is rarely out of the headlines these days, both on the internal front, economic reform, diversification, and also regionally. The extraordinary stories about Saudi relationships with Israel, for example, how that might feed into a Trump deal of the century. Thanks. Yeah. Now, I know, Ian, when you were writing for The Guardian, you would never have described Mohammed bin Salman as a young, impulsive crown prince. Because I got to say, I say to people, if I see somebody else describing him as a young, impulsive crown prince, I shall scream. Because this is, this is, 
and these are like Homeric epithets. You know, the, 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 the wine-dark sea, or, 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 or grey-eyed Athena. They're just things to fill out the meter when you're, when you're writing up the story. Um, if you look at... Um, and almost all is written about it. I'm, I'm, there's a piece, I, I should say, I'm, 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 I've got a piece coming out in the New Statesman um, uh, today or tomorrow uh, on all this. But I'll say what's in it. Um, uh, they'll probably take half my fee away for telling you before you've actually read the, the, the New Statesman. <laughs> Mind the, the fee's not very much anyway, so, um, so it doesn't really matter. Um, for me, if you look at what he's doing, the, the areas he's focusing on, corruption, uh, pushing back against Iran and trying to trying to, 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 to push back, to constrain, corral the influence of the of the religious establishment and the alternative religious establishment, the dissident sheikhs uh, in Saudi Arabia, were things also that I've done with quite a bit. There is continuity actually in what he's in the areas he's focusing on. Um, uh, Abdullah stood up in public and talked about corruption. He was the one who set up Nazer, which was the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, anti-corruption agency, which wasn't very especially effective, hasn't been very effective. But some of that was because Abdullah was old and sick, I think. The same with the Ulama. He would, make, he would in public, criticize the religious scholars for not doing enough to... So if you look at what Hamza Salman is doing, the air is, there's, there's a lot of continuity. The way he's doing it, of course, represents no continuity at all, certainly with, with, with kings since Faisal. But perhaps it does represent a harking back to Abdul Hamid, <coughs> to the founder. I, I think Mohammed bin Salman has this thing that he is in some way the second Abdul Aziz. And this in some way for him is the second foundation of the kingdom. This is a re-foundation of the kingdom. And I think he's concluded the way he's going to do this is by disruption. He is disrupting things in the kingdom. He's breaking things in the same way as he's trying to disrupt things externally by breaking things. I don't think a lot of this is impulsive. I think a lot of this is planned. One of the things they started doing from 2015 onwards uh, inside Saudi Arabia was, was, was the social surveys. So I think he's got a lot of data from inside the Saudi government, because then they've gone out to all bits of the kingdom, on what younger people want in particular. As far as I can see from social media, he remains pretty popular among the young. This idea, you know, putting, you know, putting princes in, in, I mean, I don't know if they're in the Ritz Carlton, my place, but I don't know if they're in there, but if they where are the Ritz Carlton, uh, you know, the, it's, this is going to go down pretty well with a lot of people on the street. The same with giving people, you know, the whole six whole options for entertainment on a weekend in Riyadh, which is six more than they have at the moment. So even if even if five of them are, are monster truck demolition guarded, it's still, you know, it's still a lot better than what they had before. Um, will it work? I mean, it's a, it's a question. I mean, the issue with the Saudi state is it historically it has not had the capacity to execute, particularly in a sustained way. The one state in the in the Middle East, the two states, Israel has, of course, but the, but the one major state in the Middle East that has this capacity to implement, uh, to plan strategically and implement over a period is Iran. Iran is the most formidable state in the region. And it's been doing this. You look at Soleimani, you look at the, uh, the, 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 the Hezbollah uh, guys, you look at Jafri, Razai, all these guys have been doing it, doing this stuff for three to four decades. There's nobody like that on the Saudi side. So you can break all this stuff. And I think what he's seeking to do is a refoundation. But whether you can put it back together again and it makes sense is, 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 is much bigger. But I don't think, I mean, I, you know, I, don't, I don't think Saudi is in a pre revolutionary situation. I never thought that. No Saudi, because all, apart from else, most Saudis look around the region and think, and thank their lucky stars that they're not Syria or Iraq or Libya or. Any other questions? Gentlemen at the back, name and organization. Well, thank you, JJ. My name is uh, Toby Dodge, so I've, I've got my cap. The books are available up there. Mm -hmm. The percentage is yours. <laughs> I, no I noticed, uh, I thought, three different policy recommendations to do with our first question. The first is basically to stand back and let the Gulf do what, let the Arab states of the Gulf do what they want because they're not going to listen anyway and they're on a trajectory somewhere yep. else. The second is to counter Iran much more forcibly or recognize what it's doing. But the third, I, I didn't really hear, and I w always like to ask questions I don't know the answer to. So you say American strategy on in, in some parts of Syria and Iraq militarily has been very successful. Clearly, the, the, the very recent driving out of the Islamic State in Iraq would indicate that. But you say they have no political strategy whatsoever. Um, I heartily agree with you, but 
The question is, what should that political strategy be after the defeat of that, um, and trying to stop the reconstruction of Dash 2.0? Thanks. Uh, the third point, I, I don't know quite honestly. I mean, the, the moment may have passed. I think, I think in some ways the the, 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 the fiasco of the Kurdish referendum was was a reflection of this. Not it's not because Balzani. I mean, Balzani was clearly reckless in what he did, and he was told not to do it, but he went ahead and did it and so forth. The trouble is, once he'd done it, and it all went horribly wrong, everybody, we basically stood back. And I'm, I'm not convinced that Aberdi wanted, uh, wanted the, quite the free hand that he was given to deal with this. Because w by giving him a free hand, we were essentially giving the popular mobilization units, the hashed, the free hand. And I think Aberdi was being pushed from behind, and he was meeting no resistance from in front. I think he would have welcomed somebody, it would have had to be the Americans, that stepping in and saying, we need to stop, we, we, we need to stop you pushing as far in to the disputed, to the, within the disputed internal boundaries as you are, and we need to get a, a settlement within 18 months to two years on Kirkuk, and we need to make an agreement on oil exports and all this sort of stuff. And we will now help you do this, because this, 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 this referendum has drawn, has driven a, a coach of horses through, through an Iraqi constitution, which is already um, in a shocking, in a shocking state, and it's empowered Iran, and and that, and that for me is is, is is the is is the is the real is the real calamity of this. But it may now be too late. I don't know, and especially when you've got we, we, we have Turkey, Iran, uh, and Iraq now meeting up to talk about uh, what's happening inside Iraq and. and with Syria and the installment process on, on, on Syria. I mean, there's been an application. I'm not sure what policy is available. It looks to me that the United States is simply, they're simply deciding that this, this isn't worth the candle, that if you wait long enough, the Shia will fight among themselves in, in, uh, in Iraq, Hezbollah will overextend, um, and it'll, it may all turn out for the best, but I'm not sure it will. Um, and if you're with Lebanon, I mean, we've, we've gone back to the position where we're going we, we're gonna to reinforce the Lebanese armed forces, which for me is, 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 is pretty crazy. Um, the first issue about who is supporting the Libyan government do what they want. I mean, the fact is, I mean, if you look at Libya, so I mean, for me, I was in Libya in 2011. Um, what we've basically done in Libya is say, uh, is say we support the UN. Well, what, what, what's the UN plan? The UN has a, a government which is supposed to be a government of national unity. It's not even a government of the unity of Tripoli Harbour. I mean, that's that's where they're, that's where they're all sitting. So we've got three different governments. One backed by the UN, which controls, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, plot of land like this bit, and then one sort of rump government stuck in, in, in Tripoli and one rump government stuck in Tobruk. And we have Haftar in the middle. And it's not that Haftar is the answer to Libya, but he's been a player from the beginning, and he was backed by the Emiratis. This was clear. Um, if you wanted to, 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 to have influence in Libya, um, you have to, unless you're prepared to do all the lifting yourself and put all the resources which would be necessary for you alone to shift things in a direction you want. You have to work with regional powers. I'm not sure, it, 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 I'm not, I don't think we should simply say, it's all, whatever you do is all right, because clearly Yemen is an example of where everything you do is not all right. Um, but equally, um, Yemen is a place where a solution is still available, and a solution essentially, at least in the short term, is a version of the GCC initiative from way back, which is sort of frozen. Um, and money, and letting the Houthis have access to the sea. I mean, we all know what this is. And the trouble is nobody's actually going in to Mohammed bin Salman, I don't think, and saying, we're going to make this happen as a standback. So when Jared Kushner goes and sits up to four o'clock in the morning with, with, uh, with Mohammed bin Salman, what are they talking about? Because that seems to me to be actually one of the things they should be talking about. Because it is an example of where you can institute a new sort of Pax Saudica, but you need the Americans behind you to do that. And there's all sorts of other reasons, for humanitarian reasons and so forth. It's, it's essential. Pushing back against Iran, I think clearly this is a discussion in Washington. There's, there's talk in Congress about the, you know, new sanctions pushing back or reinstituting some of the financial sanctions and the rest of it. I think we have to be very smart about this because I don't think there's any prospect of cutting the Iranian economy off again from the international banking system as was done when they were disconnected from SWIFT. <coughs> uh, but I think that's clearly under discussion. The, the chance, the, the trouble is, I think it's going to be very bitter because I don't think the U.S. administration. I, mean, I live in the United States, and I hope they let me back in. But um, I, I, there's a capacity issue with the U.S. administration about this as well. I think at the moment. And here, of course, yeah. Gentlemen at the back, then all the rest. 
Charles Moore Telegraph. Um, you gave a most brilliant account, thank you for it, of uh, what the Islamist ideology is and its various permutations. Um, you, what you didn't talk about is the effect of this in, in this country and indeed in Western countries. Um, and I'd be very interested to know what you would say about that. I mean, I assume you're saying that all the terrorist attacks we suffer and all the extremism we suffer derive from, from this. This is I mean, it's quite a broad, Islamism is a broad word, but nevertheless, that's what it all derives for in relation to all uh, Muslim-related issues. And yet it seems to be so uh, poorly understood in this country. And I wondered if you could explain why you think that is and how that could change, and whether there is another uh, narrative that could be fostered in this country which would counter it. You, you, uh, uh, and... Um, or whether it's a bad idea to think of a, a Muslim narrative in a plural society like ours, and would it be better to downgrade the whole idea of a Muslim account of anything in public discourse? Do you see what I mean? Um, I, I, what do you mean, 2017? I, spe I spent, I think, um, probably two-thirds of the last 37 years uh, outside the United Kingdom, uh, mostly in the Middle East, but also in Southeast Asia. So I, 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 and, and one of my lasting regrets is that I don't know enough about my own country. Um, so... Uh, so it's, a, it's an issue. I don't really know en enough about what's happening here. I, but I will say, I was at a conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the Middle East, uh, uh, and I was, uh, I was with uh, a senior Israeli, former security official, Amos Gilad, and somebody in the audience stood up and said, you, 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 you've told us all about the bad things that are happening. Can you tell us about the good things? What, what, is, what, is, what gives us hope? And I said, what gives me hope is, is young people. You look around the Middle East, where seventy percent of the people under thirty, whatever it is, thirty-two, and the, the, the dynamism, the creativity, uh, the ambition, the aspiration, the range of aspirations that they have—it's phenomenal. <coughs> they don't represent a community; they represent a set of individuals, and uh, that, for me, is, 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 is the important thing. I mean, one of the issues I think with policy in this country, and I, uh, this is—I can see why governments do this—is this search, is this definition of, of, of is this move to communalism? Away from, I mean, you know, Max Weber in, in Politik of Alistair Wolf talks about <coughs> the modern, the European rational state arising uh, in early modern Europe on the back of a class of secular jurists, to, uh, 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 practicing uh, uh, secular law, practicing sec essentially versions of Roman law. And this comes from sort of this issue of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the moral autonomy, moral and political autonomy of the individual. It seems to me to be absolutely fundamental. But we're moving towards this communalism, which I think is. Which is interesting because it is actually a curiously colonial way of managing your own affairs. I mean, it's, it's as if we're searching. It's the sort of thing we did in Iraq in the 1920s. We looked for people who represent particular communities. And often they claim to represent communities, but they do nothing of the sort. Um, and yet we do this here. It seems to me very odd. So if, if I'm thinking about what we do here, it's that. And some of that is about my point about ideology. So this is not because we think, you know, the, most liberals... Liberals think that to be liberal is a default state of the universe. It's not. It's an ideology. And I think you know, once we start talking about liberalism as, as a set of universal values, then we, we actually stop thinking of it as an ideology. Once you, and once you think of it as an ideology, it then becomes possible to defend it, because there are, there are contesting ideologies, of which Islamism is one. The foundational base of Islam is not the individual, it's a community. Uh, because this is where you find salvation. Now, do, do, do most Muslims, have most Muslims throughout history live their lives like that? No. I mean, in practice, you know, people live their lives as best they can. And states <laughs> govern themselves as best they can. But what Islamism does is actually <coughs> take that idea, drain it of historical context, and say this is how you should do everything. And that's the problem. So the problem for me is, is, is the issue of communalism. And finding a way back to that, what I call in the longer version, this, 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 this tradition that flows from Aristotle um, uh, <coughs> through Weber to, to, to Rawls, and uh, uh, this Aristotelian concept of the of the individual uh, uh, as, as, as living as a civic being in a political community um, with, uh, with a telos, and that telos is, 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 is to perfect the political community. Um, and that seems to me, whether this will happen, of course, because politicians, I think, hate thinking about these sort of things, uh, and they must much prefer having counter-terrorism strategies, which tell you, tell you what you're going to do about arresting the next person with a bomb. I mean, there are, other, there are other versions, there are other sources of violence in our society. We know that. In the United States, it's like in Israel, and it's all sorts of other things. Uh, Islamism represents, and for me, Islamism, the issue of Islamism is not, the issue is not violence. I mean, violence comes from all sorts of different sources. It's the ideological challenge. 
It's this fundamental dissonance between communalism and, and individualism. Thank you. I've disappointed everyone. My apologies. John's been on his feet for well over an hour. He brings things to a close. My pleasure to call upon Tom Hewlett, MP, Chairman of the Communist Foreign Affairs Select Committee, himself has had much distinguished service both in and out of Europe <coughs> in the region for political both affairs. Thank you, Dean uh, and Policy Exchange, for hosting this lecture. I feel uh, rather a fraud standing here after a lecture like that, which covered so ably and in such a complete sense, not only uh, where we have got to, but the roots uh, of political Islam taking us not only through al Banan and Qutb, uh, right through uh, the region and uh, particularly uh, an area as uh, Sir John knows very well that was great interest to me. Uh, how we deal, how we shape policy, uh, particularly in relation to Iran. And I have to say, for a typically thought-provoking and insightful address, it is only right that this is in the memory of two of the greatest um, scholars in the modern Middle East. Now, as I'm quickly discovering, my position as chair of the Parliament, uh, Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, foreign affairs is one of those subjects on which very, very many people feel qualified to do an awful lot of talking, um, much of it with little to say. Uh, yet Sir John here has given us absolutely no cause for concern. It's hard to think of someone with a comparable range of learning, which is combined with an unparalleled depth of experience gleaned from years of service in the region. Uh, and not surprisingly, what he has to say is always interesting. And doubtless, he could have gone on for much longer. Indeed, I'm told that the full version, the written version of this lecture, which is being published by Policy Exchange, is twice as long and comes with 113 footnotes and 35 pages of reference. So if anyone has any trouble sleeping, there's a little extra for you there. We're very grateful, therefore, for his self-restraint. But his words tonight uh, do offer a very sober reflection, indeed, uh, on the Kaderian perspective of the Middle East. He has urged us to see the region as it, it actually is, not as we would like it to be. Words, I think, are especially pertinent, given the tendency of some, uh, indeed some who have a, a very loud voice in the House of Commons, uh, to project on the Middle East their illusions <coughs> and false premises. On the subject of Islamism, for instance, we have too often been credulous of the fine words uttered by spokesmen for the Muslim Brotherhood, too inclined to accept their bona fides as moderates, as uh, Sir John put it, Christian Democrats in different guise and with whom we should do business. Sir John's lecture stands out uh, as an important corrective to such lazy, superficial thinking and is therefore in the finest tradition of the Kadurians, both Ellie and Sylvia, whose own commitment was to rational empirical inquiry, which tried to set aside the ideological biases that we all harbour. It is in that commitment to producing a cogent and accurate version of history as it actually is that is so important in the Middle East, myth and apprehension are all too common. And I think Sir John is absolutely right that we who are charged with overseeing the nation's foreign policy, both within Parliament and, of course, in Whitehall, are sometimes too timid in pushing back against those narratives that presume our own malignancy and bad-mindedness. And having fought myself in the Iraq War in uh, 2003, I remember coming across uh, a shepherd with some sheep about a week after the invasion and the border was opened for the very first time as the Ba'athist guards had disappeared, claiming to go to a market that hadn't been there in 20 years. Mm -hmm. And of course, we being good British soldiers with our limits of powers of arrest and detention, having searched his vehicle and found nothing, but being absolutely certain who he was and what he was doing there, could do nothing but wave him on. And that was one of the first waves, I suspect, of the Iranian influence that Sir John has spoken about. So having traveled in the region, I too, like Sir John, have heard uh, the all too familiar conspiracy theories that the West deliberately carved up the Muslim world after World War I, or that we or the Americans were behind every coup and change of government to ever happen in the region. In fact, one of the great ways of making sure that the plumbing was fixed in my flat in uh, Beirut, of course, was to blame the Israelis. It was the only way that the landlord would sort out the various broken issues. Um, and I've also heard, of course, that we, or the Americans, first created 
uh, al-Qaeda and now, of course, the Israelis are accused of creating the Islamic State. Now, these half-truths and outright fabrications uh, distort the politics of the Middle East. It is depressing that they also infect so much commentary on the region, including here in the West. And I don't know how many of you heard Pat McFadden condemning this from the Labour House, uh, from the Labour side of the House of Commons, where he called out the implicit racism and sexism to assume that the only real actors with agency in the world are white males and everyone else is a victim. Well, Pat McFadden was absolutely right, and Sir John, you absolutely put your finger on it, that agency lies with all actors and with all individuals. And even more lamentable, I suppose, is the fact that we effectively connive in their dissemination all too often when we blithely accept them and fail to argue our case. Thankfully, the lecture we have heard tonight betrays no hint of such intellectual indolence or indeed insipidness. Sir John has delivered a powerful and important testimony and, on, and an important lesson on the significance of history, even in today's foreign policy and the necessity for clarity of thinking and honesty in thought. I would hope that anyone interested in the politics of the region views this lecture as required listening or indeed reading. I look forward to receiving the full version and in the meantime, I do. I hope that you will all join me in thanking Sir John for this scholarly yet resonant and stimulating lecture.